Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Now TV and Morning Musings. I do appreciate you being with me. My name is Don K. Preston, and as stated, this is what I call my morning musings. I appear here every Friday morning, 9.30 a.m. Central Time. I hope that you will tune in. We have almost a year now of archived programs that you'll be able to go back, that you'll be able to watch. We have been investigating. I've been sharing with you the critical issue of the challenge of Christ. Let me remind you what the challenge of Christ is all about. In Matthew 16, 27 and 28, Jesus said, The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according to his works. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I, I have to tell you, these verses have perplexed and challenged and troubled Christians for 2,000 years. Because the language is very explicit, it's very graphic, it's unambiguous. But because of preconceived ideas about the nature of the coming of the Lord, I mean, after all, everyone, 98, 99% of Christianity believes that when Jesus said the Son of Man will come on the, in the glory of the Father, that he was saying he, as a five foot five Jewish man, was going to come out of heaven in a physical body, riding on a literal cloud, and he's going to destroy heaven and earth. Famous theologians have struggled with this. Rudolf Bultmann, in a former generation, Rudolf Bultmann, uh, his name is still recognized in most seminaries as being a name of, uh, of incredible importance. In his book, Primitive Christianity, Rudolf Bultmann said, every schoolboy knows that Jesus promised to come back in the first century uh, in his generation and put an end to human history. Huh. Every schoolboy knows he didn't do it. You see the problem? Now, you have to keep something in mind. Rudolf Bultmann began his theological education as a believer in Jesus. He began his theological education as a believer in the inspiration of the Bible. But as he encountered verses like this, he literally had no concept of so many critical, crucial elements. For instance, Rudolf Bultmann absolutely failed to understand that the promise of the coming of the Lord with the angels in judgment at the end of the age was a promise made to Old Covenant Israel. And it was, it was to be fulfilled at the end of Old Covenant Israel's age, not at some so-called end of the Christian age. Rudolf Bultmann even went on record one time as saying, whatever the story of Israel may be, it is not our story. Israel's story is over and done. Therefore, we have to create another story for us. Oh my goodness gracious. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very carefully. The New Testament writers, as I've shared with you repeatedly, the New Testament writers were emphatic that their story, their eschatology, their gospel was nothing but the hope of Israel found in the Old Covenant prophets. And it would be at the end of the time foretold by those Old Covenant prophets in promises made to Old Covenant Israel it would be at that time that God's salvation would flow to all the nations. And thus, when Rudolf Bultmann said, Israel's story is not our story, he created a dichotomy in the biblical narrative that is absolutely unknown. Secondly, Rudolf Bultmann had no concept of metaphoric language. He had no concept of Hebraic apocalyptic language, as I've shared with you repeatedly. On this program, the language of the coming of the Lord with a shout, with the angels, on the clouds, with a shout, sound of a trumpet, is typical Hebraic ap apocalyptic language that was never ever intended to be taken literally. Rudolf Bultmann did not know that. He did not recognize that. Like most Christians today, 
when he saw the language of the coming of the Lord on the clouds with the angels and flaming fire, he believed that that had to do with the end of time and a literal, visible, bodily coming of Jesus. Not a coming of Jesus, quote, in the glory of the Father. And as a result of, result of his failure to understand those primary, those root issues, Rudolf Bultmann said Jesus failed. He was a false prophet. And in essence, Rudolf Bultmann could not meet, could not answer the challenge of Christ. What is that challenge of Christ? That challenge is from Jesus' own lips, as I have shared with you repeatedly. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. John 10, 37 and 38. Folks, that's the challenge of Christ. And, you know, even this morning, as I was on the Internet dealing with some people on Facebook. And these individuals said, time statements mean absolutely nothing. One of them went so far as to say, well, had Jesus come back in the glory of the Father in A.D. 70, would that falsify the time statements? I seriously doubt it, this individual said. Really? You seriously doubt it? In other words, if Jesus came back in the glory of the Father in that generation, you're not willing to accept it would, that it would validate Him as the Son of God, that it would validate His Word, that He kept His Word to do what He said He was going to do when He said He was going to do it? I, I'm telling you, some people have all but lost their minds. They've certainly abandoned logic when it comes to accepting Jesus' word. Here is an individual who claims to be a Christian and who is only willing tacitly to say, well, yeah, if he came back in the glory of the Father, uh, that would not invalidate the time statements. Maybe. Maybe? If Jesus did what he said he was going to do, when he said he was going to do it, then that would mean that he did what the Father gave him to do, and we're supposed to believe in him. But if he didn't do what he said he was going to do, when he said he was going to do it, then we're not supposed to believe in him. That's the challenge of Christ. So, over the last several weeks, even months now, I've been sharing with you about the challenge of Christ and going to 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter said, in the last days, scoffers are going to come. I've shared with you that the Old Testament prophets, just as Peter said, foretold the coming of those scoffers before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And in our last couple of videos, I have pointed out to you uh, of how the scoffers appeared in the first century. Now I want to turn over to a text that gives us some insight into the nature, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, into the nature of what these scoffers were doing. Now, let me drive home the nature of the coming of the Lord. As taught by Isaiah 28, therefore, as taught by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, <coughs> I pointed out to you in last week's video how that the Lord said He was going to come as He came at Perazim, and as at Gibeon. And yet, in Isaiah chapter 28, he said that he was going to do his work, his awesome work, his unusual act. Well, guess what? In Isaiah chapter 29, he repeated that. His coming, as at Perazim, and as at Gibeon was on the behalf of Israel. It was to deliver her from her enemies. It was to deliver her from destruction. Only this time around, 
This coming of the Lord that the scoffers were denying, which is the coming of the Lord of 2 Peter chapter 3, this would be an unusual act, something they were not expecting. As John Calvin said, as Adam Clark said, this time it would not be on the behalf of Israel to deliver her from her enemies. It would be against Israel. So here we have a promise of the coming of the Lord <clears throat> against the unbelievers and against the scoffers. Now, I want you to go with me, and I hope you have your Bible open, all right? I hope that you will go with me to Acts chapter 13. Paul is in the synagogue, and he stands up, and I will begin reading with verse 36. David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things when, from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken by the prophets comes upon you. Now, you really, really, really got to catch the power of this. He quotes verbatim Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Okay, let's take a moment here and ask ourselves the question. What did Habakkuk chapter 1, or the book of Habakkuk, what did the book of Habakkuk predict? Oh, and by the way, if you want one of the most magnificent, awe-inspiring, faith-building statements of faith, you need to read Habakkuk chapter 3. Why? Well, let me explain. The book of Habakkuk was written shortly before the fall of Jerusalem at the hand of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, which occurred in 586 B.C. Habakkuk the prophet had the Lord's prophecy, and it was an awful thing. The Babylonians were a scourge on the earth. They were cruel. They were vindictive. They were merciless. They had a habit of when they conquered people, pardon me, they would take, they would take oversized fish hooks. It's the only way to, to describe it. Great big iron hooks. And they would pierce it through the chest or even the back, sometimes even the lips of people, and they would lead them into captivity. Can you imagine the horror? So Habakkuk hears the prediction of the impending destruction of his people, of God's people, at the hand of the Babylonians, and, and Habakkuk writes, and he laments in Habakkuk chapter 1, 12 and following, O Lord, you are too righteous. You are too, too holy to look upon evil. Your ears cannot countenance that which is corrupt. How then can you use a people which is more wicked than your people to judge your people? Lord, I just don't understand. And the Lord essentially said, well, listen, Habakkuk, yes, <clears throat> it's true that the Babylonians are a wicked people, but they are my instrument in my hand. Now, keep this in mind. Do you remember when we looked at the book of Zephaniah? We looked at Jeremiah 4. 
that called the impending destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. the day of the Lord. Do you remember that? A time when heaven and earth would be destroyed, when the earth would be without form and void, Jeremiah chapter 4, 25 and following. A day which, in which man and beast alike would be wiped out. Now remember that. That's critical to understand. This is what Habakkuk sees on, on the horizon. The day of the Lord. And he's frightened out of his mind. He knows the horror that is involved. So he complains. It is a philosophical complaint. Lord, uh, you know, it may be true that, that our people are corrupt, but they're your people. They're your covenant people. The Babylonians are not your covenant people. They were not chosen by you. They were not beloved by you. Interestingly enough, prophecy would be given that one day even the Babylonians could come to the Lord. But that's another issue. Point of fact is, Habakkuk just did not understand how the Lord could use a nation that was more corrupt, more unholy, more immoral than they were to judge them. And the Lord acknowledged that the Babylonians were worse, but he said, look, Habakkuk, you stand on your watchtower. You just stand back and watch. But he said, it's true that I'm going to perform a work in your days, Habakkuk, an unusual work that a man would not believe if it were told him. It's so horrific, and it's unusual. See, just like Isaiah chapter 28 and 29, it's an unusual act because God had acted so often in history on the behalf of his people, but now he's promising, behold, I work a work in your days that a man would not believe. So here is Paul in the synagogue. He has just preached Jesus. Now, who is Jesus? He's the chief cornerstone of Isaiah chapter 28 that the scoffers would reject and deny. And that Isaiah, Yahweh through Isaiah, said, you, listen, do not be scoffers. For behold, the Lord will rise up as at Parazim and as at Gibeon, but he will do an unusual work, his incredible work. This time it will not be for Israel, it will be against. And now here is Habakkuk. Just prior to the fall of Jerusalem in the 6th century B.C., being told the Babylonians are coming, and the Lord says, Habakkuk, you have to understand, I am going to do something in your day that a man would not even believe it. Why? Because it's such an unusual thing. It's such an incredible thing, and it's such a horrible thing. And so once again, here's Paul preaching to the Jews in the synagogue about Jesus, the rejected cornerstone, and he says, through this man, you can have the forgiveness of your sins. You can be justified from everything that the law of Moses could not give you. Verse 40, beware therefore, see, don't reject the word. Don't deny the word. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers. What's a despiser? It's a scoffer. <laughs> you see? Paul's talking about the very scoffers that Peter was talking about. He's talking about the very scoffers that Isaiah was predicting. Uh, uh, predicting. He's talking about, about the very scoffers that Habakkuk was talking about. Those who denied the impending judgment of Jerusalem. There were scoffers in Habakkuk's day. There were scoffers in Paul's day. 
What were they denying? Well, the scoffers in the day of Jeremiah, the scoffers in the days of Zephaniah, the scoffers in the days of Habakkuk were denying that God was going to destroy Jerusalem and judge Israel. What is Paul urging his audience not to reject the gospel? Why? Because if they rejected it, the same thing that Habakkuk foretold would come to pass. They could scoff at it, but it wouldn't change it. Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. It's the same kind of a day of the Lord as Jeremiah and as Zephaniah, both of whom said that it was near in their day, a day of the Lord upon Jerusalem in which the Lord would come in judgment and destroy Jerusalem. And he came by means of the Babylonians, and thus Paul, picking up on that, says, you remember that? You remember how that happened? You remember that day of the Lord? If you reject the chief cornerstone, like Isaiah 28 predicted, then the same thing that happened in the days of Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Habakkuk will come to pass on you. Do not be scoffers. Do not, be, do not despise the word of the Lord. Now, at this juncture, it's very, 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 very important for, for us to understand, you see, that what was happening in, in Paul's day was that Israel was blinded. The great, the great part of Israel was blinded, and I, I want to go over here very, very quickly uh, because I'm running out of time. I want to run over to Romans chapter 11. Remember, Paul is preaching the gospel to the Jew first, then to the Greek. But Israel of his day was rejecting the message. And he says, Lord, they have not obeyed the gospel. And so he poses the question, well, have they not heard? Yes, they have heard. The sound has gone throughout all the world. Which means, guess what? Pardon me. Since the sound of the gospel had, been go had gone out into all the world, that meant that Israel, hearing the gospel and rejecting it, was without excuse. They were without excuse for their unbelief and for their rejection of the gospel of Christ. And so the Lord says, Did Israel not know, Romans chapter 10, verse 19, and he says, First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. Now, you remember when we went over Isaiah? Of how Paul used Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 to speak of Israel of his day that was rejecting the gospel. And as a result of their rejection of the gospel, the Gentiles were being called. Now I want you to notice that in Romans chapter 10 and verse 19, when he says, Lord, did Israel not know? Did, did Israel not know that the gospel was going to be preached to them and that there was a danger in rejecting that gospel? And Paul says, Paul calls Moses as a witness and says, you know what? Moses foretold this very thing. Now, here's some homework for you, okay? Because when we get back to Isaiah chapter 28, I'm going to show you that Isaiah 28 in its prediction of the day of the Lord and the scoffers was predicting the fulfillment of the song of Moses. The song of Moses is Deuteronomy chapter 32. 
which was a prediction of Israel's last days. Twice, and I'll share these with you when we get there. Twice in the chapter, it, it says that the song was about Israel's last days. That means it's not about the end of the Christian age. It's not about the end of time. It is about the end of old covenant Israel and her covenant history. Okay, so in Deuteronomy 32, 19 to 21. Now remember, Paul is talking about Israel of his day refusing the gospel, rejecting the gospel, and as a result, Paul going to the Gentiles. And Paul says, did Israel not know this was going to happen? And Paul says, no, 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 no. Israel knew it was going to happen because Moses foretold it. Moses foretold in Deuteronomy 32, 20 and 21, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a people. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Now that was in the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32. Paul is bringing Moses forward as, uh, as a witness against Israel for her first century unbelief and as justification for Paul's mission to the Gentiles. So what does that mean? That means that Paul was saying that Israel's last days were present in the first century. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. These unbelievers here are the scoffers of Acts 13 who are rejecting the gospel. They are the scoffers of 2 Peter chapter 3, which means 2 Peter chapter 3 was about the unbelieving Jews of the first century. They are not yet future scoffers who are going to come at future, some future time, or even today, denying the coming of the Lord. We will develop this even more next week. See you then.